Chapter 3 The Complete Ritual of Black Magic The Pact of the Black Art The Black Pact Pacts with Demons and Escaping the Consequences What is a pact with the devil? Selling one's soul by a formal, written act of contract? Or the very fact of communication with powers of darkness? Study of the magical rites of Western literature shows that there is much confusion on this point among the protagonists of various methods of demoniac conjuration. The reason for this is certainly historic and can be explained only from an historical point of view. If we take for granted what seems generally agreed about the origins of Western magic, that the evocation rites are derived ultimately from Semitic and Babylonian sources, things become a little clearer. We can see, from the materials available to us, that in the far-off eastern Mediterranean days of the rites, demons and other supernatural beings were wooed by a combination of propitiation and arrogance, strange bedfellows, but typical of the strange workings of the occultist mind. Spirits, it was felt, were possessed of powers which they could, and under certain circumstances would, transfer temporarily to human beings. They had to be propitiated because their primary function was the doing of evil, and this had to be prevented before they could be put to work. One might find some sort of analogy in, say, electricity. If you want to use electrical power, you must first of all be sure that you are insulated against its lethal power. Then, by means of certain knowledge, you can put it to work. Ignorance of the nature of electricity, or spirits, is not important. What is fundamental, however, is the technique by which spirits can be bound and constrained to act for the operator. The electrician has to know as to what metals conduct the current, what substances are insulators, and so on. The magician likewise believes that he must have his circle or triangle as an insulator, his equipment for attracting the demon, his talisman and words of power for directing their force to further his own ends. Not all rituals agree that a pact is necessary to the employment of spirit aid, but that the belief was both widespread and generally credited is substantiated by the fact that most of the important black magical codices require either a formal pact and a sacrifice, or at least some form of contract between the spirit and the operator. When the need arises for the making of a pact, several mages affirm that the consequences of giving one's pledge may be escaped by cheating the devil in any one of a number of ingenious ways. There are innumerable tales of work and miracles wrought by spirits under promise of reward which they never received. Throughout Europe, in fact, bridges and buildings exist which are pointed out as having been built in this way. On one famous occasion, a celebrated cleric is reported to have asked the devil to erect a bridge in return for the soul of the first creature to pass over it, which turned out to be a cat. Other tales tell of the devil appearing and forcing a pact on some poor farmer, for such pacts are sometimes unilateral in origin. In the first year, the demon asked that everything above the ground should be his, and the farmer planted turnips and presented his visitor with the tops. The following season, of course, Lucifer demanded all that grew below the surface. All he got was the roots of the wheat that the wily man had planted in all his fields. The large number of these stories extant goes a long way towards scotching the idea that his infernal majesty is as diabolically clever as one might think. Even when the devil has been actually conjured, and the magician and his assistants are cowering within the protection of the magical circle, they have but to throw him any small animal, and he accepts it apparently without question. Some measure of exoneration may be pleaded by Satan on the ground that few rites involve conjuration of the potentate himself. Grimoires, such as the Grand Grimoire, indicate that it is with his immediate subordinates, 
Beelzebuth and Astaroth among them, that the actual pact is made. So much for the preliminaries. Now comes the question of the pact itself. Sorcerers were convinced that contact with the powers of darkness could be achieved at any time, providing that the appropriate rites were observed. Certain words, clothes, perfumes and invocations were considered indispensable. Other experts, for example those of the church, maintained that any invocation to the devil, such as, I'd sell my soul if, could be followed by acceptance by Satan and that the mere offer of a soul was enough, in many cases, to ensure its ratification. Many cases are on record of people who claimed that the devil appeared without even being mentioned. All they did was to build up sufficient emotional feeling about something desired, and the demon appeared and offered terms in return for performing the task. The general Christian attitude, of course, is that the very act of being mentally prepared to negotiate with any power other than God was an offer of contract and might be taken up at any moment. So we have the implicit and explicit methods. In this book, it is only the latter with which we are directly concerned, the ritual according to its own adepts, which magic had laid down for contact with the supposed powers of evil. What are the motives for associating oneself with Satan? According to the grimoires, these are both constructive and destructive. Constructive insofar as they will require something to be done, brought or taught to the advantage of the operator. Destructive where it is desired to bring down ruin, revenge or other disaster upon anyone or anything. Among the so-called constructive efforts, those most favoured by invocants are money and power, the finding of immense treasures, the acquiring of honour and glory, of the gift of tongues, invisibility, the love of men or women, transport from one place to another in the twinkling of an eye, and so forth. The following is one of the simplest rites given in any grimoire which figures in the Grand Clavicle, claiming its origin with Solomon the King, son of David. The Conjuration of Lucifuge Rofocal First, as always, comes the preparation of the operator. At the exact second when the sun is on the horizon, the magician takes a new, virgin, unused knife and cuts a wand from a hazel tree, cut during the hour of the sun. This must be a wild tree, which is virgin in that it has not yet borne any fruit. This wand is to be preserved with the other instruments of the operation, the two candles, which should have been consecrated to the process, a bloodstone, and the documents. There are two documents. The first is a paper containing a conjuration of the spirit, which conjuration is presumably read from it, and the other is the demand to the spirit, specifying details as to exactly what help is needed. In addition to these instruments, magicians were generally provided with two or more pentagrams for protection, a container for incense, writing materials, and a brazier containing willow wood, which latter burns throughout the rite. The process which is being described does not, however, need the construction of a magical circle. In its place, a triangle is drawn on the ground, in some remote and inaccessible spot. The master and, generally, two assistants first of all choose the place, a ruined church or castle or some such deserted spot. With the hematite stone, the magician then draws on the earth the triangle which is to be their refuge, and places the candle on either side of it. At the foot of the triangle, the name of Jesus or some other protective name is drawn, such as Elohim Tetragrammaton. Stepping within the precincts of the triangle, the master then begins the conjuration of the spirit, in this case Lucifuge Rofocal, as follows.
O Emperor Lucifer, chief of all the spirits which rebelled, I beg thee to favour me in this conjuration which I am about to perform to Lucifuge Rofakal, thy minister. O Prince Beelzebuth, I adjure thee to protect me in this work. O Earl Astaroth, favour me and permit me tonight to obtain the appearance of the great Lucifuge in human shape and without any evil effluvium. And that he may allow me, in return for the pact which I will sign, the wealth which I am in need of. O great Lucifuge, I beg thee to leave thy home, wherever it may be, and come to this place to speak with me. If thou dost not this, I will constrain thee to appear by the force of the great living God, his Son and his Spirit. Do my bidding at once, or thou shalt be tormented for ever by the force of the words of power of the great clavicle of Solomon, which he used to compel revolted spirits to obey him and accept his contract. Appear then immediately, or I shall torture thee with the force of the words of power from the key of Solomon. The mage then utters these terrible words of power. Aglon tetragram vacion, stimulaton esphares retrogrammaton, oliaram irion, esition, existion, eriona, onera, Orasim, Moza, Messias, Sote, Emmanuel, Sabaot, Adone, Te Adora, et Te Invoco. Amen. When these dread phrases have been pronounced, Lucifuge will put in an instant appearance, and will address the magician in these words. I am here. What dost thou seek? Why dost thou interfere with my rest? Give me answer. At this point, the invocants are to be very sure that they do not step outside the triangle. Indeed, it would mean violent death, we are told, for them to do this at any time at all until the spirit has departed. Summoning up his courage, the magician addresses Lucifuge. I desire to make a pact with thee for the purpose of obtaining riches at once. If thou wilt not agree to this, I shall blast thee with the words of power of the key. Lucifuge, however, is not so easily to be trapped, and may demure thus. I will agree only if thou wilt agree to give thy body and soul to me after twenty years, to use as I please. At this the mage flings down in front of the spirit the pact, which he has inscribed with his own hand on a piece of virgin parchment, often in his own blood, and duly signed. Upon it are written, I promise the great Lucifuge to reward him after twenty years for treasures given to me, and I sign. For some reason, however, the spirit may refuse the request. If this happens, he will disappear, and he will have to be recalled with the great conjuration. The Great Conjuration I conjure thee, Lucifuge, by the power of Adonai the Great, to appear at once, and I conjure thee by Ariel, Jehovah, Aqua, Tagla, Mathon, Aorios, Almoazin, Arios, Membroth, Varios, Majods, Sulfe, Gabots, Salamandre, Tabots, Gingua, Jana, Etitnamus, Zariatnatmis. A E A I A T M O A A M V P M S C S I C G A J F Z. The initial letters refer to a repetition of the great names Adonai, Elohim, and so on. These words of power were used at least as long ago as the powerful Sehem of the Babylonians. We are informed that Lucifuge will then appear again and address the operator in these words. Why dost thou thus torture me? Let me rest and I will give thee in exchange that treasure which is most near. The condition is that thou dost reserve for me one piece of money on the first day of each month. Also thou must not invoke me more than once in each week, and that between the tenth hour of the night and the second hour of the morning. Take thy pact, for I have signed it. If thou shouldst fail in the undertaking, thou shalt be mine entirely in twenty years. 
the operator will then speak to the demon and agree to his terms, asking him to point out the way to the nearest treasure. The mage can then leave the triangle, provided that he has brought his wand. He will follow the demon to the treasure and throw down the pact upon it. Then the gold is touched with the wand. After this, the sorcerer can carry back as much treasure as he can to the shelter of the triangle, but he must be careful to walk backwards and then discharge the spirit thus. Go in peace and peace with you. Come whenever I shall call. Amen. This completes the rite as laid down in that most notorious grimoire, the true grimoire. This interesting text resembles in several ways the Key of Solomon, and it is probably based upon the key or another book which laid down this characteristic kind of ritual. For this reason, it has been regarded by some commentators, many of whom seem not even to have actually read it, as of later production than other rituals. This, however, is something which cannot really be established at this stage of knowledge. There are, it is true, references in the editions available to us to Christianity and Christian teachings. This, however, proves nothing beyond the fact that it may have been Christianized any time before the 16th century. There have been several exchanges between writers upon the question of whether the true grimoire is genuine or not. This, as any unbiased reader will at once perceive, depends entirely upon what one means by genuine, upon the prejudice of the reader himself. It was certainly one of the source books of the French occultist Eliphas Levy, who was considered the last of the professing magicians, and whose works have been admirably translated by a British writer. It is not necessarily spurious, insofar as it contains a process for evocation which is in line with black magical rituals familiar to the sorcerers of the Middle Ages. It has been denounced by several writers as diabolical and degenerate, though one is tempted to wonder why they bother with it at all, when every fibre of their being revolts, apparently, at the awful rites. The true grimoire, or true clavicles, does not exist in English. There are Latin versions and some in Italian. Those best known in England include the translations in French, particularly that of the year 1517, which asserts that it is translated from the Hebrew and published by Alebek the Egyptian at Memphis. A variation of the rite for conjuring lucifuge is given in the notorious Grand Grimoire. Also claiming descent from the Solomonic Dispensation, the Grimoire tells how one Antonio Veneciana del Rabina actually copied its text from the documents of Solomon himself. Compared with the process as laid down in the foregoing extract, this conjuration is difficult and complicated. According to some occultists, however, it is more reliable, and it may in fact provide a more complete account of the system followed by the original from which both books are derived. A bloodstone must be acquired, and guarded carefully by the operator, as he goes about the business of preparing the blood sacrifice essential to success. The sacrifice, or victim of the art, is a virgin kid. Having bought this, the maid removes its head with one stroke, if he can, on the third day of the moon. The victim is prepared for sacrifice by making a wreath of verbena and decorating its throat with this. The wreath, it may be noted, is to be tied with a green ribbon. Repairing to some place far from the haunts of men, the operator prepares for the sacrifice. His robe is rolled up in such a way as to bear the right shoulder. A fire of willow wood burns in a large brazier. A clean and new knife, newly consecrated no doubt, is employed for the killing. Just before the actual sacrifice, this invocation of sacrifice is to be uttered with feeling and trust. I offer this creature to thee, O great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, and Jehovah, in the honor and power and the resplendence of thy name, which is greater than all the spirits. 
O great Adonai, agree to accept it as agreeable. Amen. At this point the sacrifice is to be offered by cutting the throat of the kid. Now the advantage of the large brazier becomes apparent. The body, after having been skinned, is thrown upon the flames and allowed to burn to cinders. As soon as this is finished, the magician throws handfuls of ashes towards the sunrise and calls upon the deity again. In the honour and the glory and the splendour of thy name, O great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovah, I spill the blood of this sacrifice. Grant, great Adonai, that it be an agreeable sacrifice. The skin of the kid has been kept by the operator for the purpose of making the circle of evocation, from which he will later call the spirit to aid him. There is now a second rite to be performed, the making of the blasting wand, which has power over spirits to torment and force their obedience, and which is thus manufactured. Making the Blasting Wand A wild hazel tree, which has never fruited, is to be located in a place which is generally deserted, and this should have on it a branch which is about nineteen and a half inches long. It must not be handled until the actual moment of its cutting. The knife which was used in the sacrifice of the kid is taken, with the blood still upon it, and as the sun rises the cut is made, accompanied by an invocation given thus. I beg thee, O great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovah, exert thy beneficence towards me, and give to this rod as I cut it the power and the virtue of the rods of Jacob, of Moses, and of Joshua the powerful. I beg thee, O great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovah, to place in this wand the entire strength of Samson, the anger of Emmanuel, and the blasting power of the mighty Zariatnatmik, he who will revenge against sin on the day of judgment. Amen. Now the operator turns his head in the direction of the sun and takes his rod home. The process of the completion of the rod is done in this manner. Apparently no other person is to be allowed to touch the rod. Therefore, when iron caps are needed for each end, a stratagem is to be employed. The cassist is enjoined to find a piece of other wood, similar in size to that of the branch, and high forth to a blacksmith. This worthy is to be ordered to take the actual knife of sacrifice and from the blade to make two caps to fit over the ends of the dummy rod. When this is completed, the caps are transferred to the ends of the real wand by the magician himself. The instrument is ready to be used when the caps have been magnetized with the help of a lodestone and these words said over it. I conjure thee by the great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovah, to attract all that I shall require through the power of the greatest Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovah. I order thee, by the irreconcilability of fire and water, to cause all that I wish drawn apart, just as all things were separated on the day of creation. Amen. Some lesser-known books and illustrations indicate that such words as tetragrammaton are written along the length of the wand. This grimoire does not mention such an inscription, but I have an illustration in my collection with Agla on one end of the wand, Adonai on the other, and the tetragrammaton in the middle, as aforesaid. Having obtained the skin and the rod, the magician is almost ready to perform the rite itself. As in the former process, he is to have two candles, and they are made by a virgin girl from previously unused wax. Several other items are also needed. These are two candlesticks, two wreaths of verbena, steel, tinder and flints for fire-making, holy water and incense, brandy and camphor, and four nails from the coffin of a child. The skin has been cut up into strips a coin of gold or silver to present to the spirit when he appears, 
completes the list of accessories carried by the magician. If he is accompanied by two helpers, they are to bear these items and to be at all times strictly under his orders. Making the Circle The grimoire directs that the circle is to be made on the ground by means of strips from the sacrificial kid's skin, and these are fixed with the coffin nails. When this is complete, the hematite stone is taken and used to describe a triangle within the circle, and touching it at all three points. The first point to be touched when making the triangle is that which faces east. It is now that the magician and the assistants, if he is accompanied, enter the triangle and place the candles in their holders and surrounded by the verbena wreaths to the right and left of the triangle and within the circle itself. Upon no account should the important tracing of letters be forgotten, for this ceremony is said to protect the invocants from the approach of demons. On the east, outside the circle, is to be written a capital A, a small a, and a small y. Inside the circle and at the base of the triangle is to be written J-H-S, the name of Jesus. Now the candles are lighted and a fire started in a brazier, which should be nurtured with a little brandy and camphor. As soon as the fire and candles are going well, the invocant addresses the deity. This incense of mine, O great Adonai, is the best that I am able to obtain, purified like this charcoal, made from the best wood. These are offerings, O great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovem, to thee with my heart and soul. Accept them, O great Adonai, and accept them as a sacrifice. Amen. By this time there may be a number of spirits around the circle. They are likely, it seems, to make a good deal of noise. They are to be ignored, and the assistants are not to speak a single word, but to allow all invocations to be performed by the master. A prayer is now made, while the assistants see that the fire is burning well. O great living God, in one and the same person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I adore thee with the deepest humility and I submit to thy holy protection with that complete belief. I believe with the most sincere faith that thou art my maker, my benefactor, my sustainer, and my master, and I have no other desire than that I should belong to thee throughout eternity. Amen. There is a pause here, while the master sees that all is well with the lights and fire, and then he resumes with the supplication. O great and living God, that created man that he should be happy in this life, who has furnished all things for his needs, who has said that all things should be under the will of man, and who will not allow that the rebellious spirit should possess the treasures that have been formed for our needs in this world, grant me, O great God, the power to dispose of them, by the fearful and terrible names of the clavicle, Adonai, Elohim, Jehovah, Tagla. Amen. There are variations in the names given at the end. One version has Adonai, Ariel, Jehovah, Tagla, another Adonai, Elohim, Tagla, Mathon, and Ariel. The operator then takes some of the camphor and casts it into the flames of the brazier with the words, I offer thee this incense as the purest which I have been able to obtain, O great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, and Jehovah. Deign to receive it as an acceptable sacrifice, O great Adonai, and be favorable to me in thy power, and make me successful in this great undertaking. Amen. Now that all the preparatory rituals have been accomplished, comes the actual calling of Lucifuge. Emperor Lucifer, Prince and Master of the Rebel Spirits, I ask thee to leave thy abode in whichever part of the world it may be, to come and speak with me. I command and order thee in the name of the great living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to come without making an evil smell, to answer in a loud and intelligible voice, 
article by article, what I shall ask thee. Failing this, thou shalt be constrained by the power of the great Adonai, Elohim, Ariel, Jehovem, Tagla, Mathon, and by all the other higher spirits, who will compel thee against thy will. Come, come, submiritalor lucifuge, or thou shalt be eternally tortured by the power of this blasting wand. It is said to be almost certain that the spirit will present himself before the circle with these awful words. Should, however, he neglect to appear, the next conjuration is resorted to. I command and oblige thee, Emperor Lucifer, by the writ of the great living God, by his Son and by the Holy Spirit, and I vow that in a quarter of an hour I shall smite thee with this frightful blasting wand. Amen. Having given the spirit an ultimatum, the sorcerer waits for the allotted time. During this period no sound is to be made. The spirit can be tortured in his absence by plunging the wand into the flames of the fire, which should evoke horrible screams. This time Lucifuge should definitely come, and ask why he is being tormented thus. The Carcist then tells the spirit as to the times when he is to appear and what he is to do, according to a timetable which has been drawn up beforehand. After some further threats with the wand, the demon will agree to terms and will indicate the route to the nearest treasure. Certain formalities have to be observed in taking possession of this, the assistants, for instance, must not leave the circle. Only the chief sorcerer may quit the circle's protective area and follow the spirit, taking care to leave the enchanted place at the point where the word Adonai is written. He must carry at all times the wand, which will enable him to discourage the fierce and dangerous dog or other evil thing which is guarding the treasure. The very man who originally buried the hoard will be encountered, and a fight will ensue for its possession. But he will overcome this, and will take one coin from the hoard and exchange one of his own to assert ownership. Placing the pact, or the conjuration in written form, on the gold, he will retire backwards to the safety of the circle, bearing with him as much of the treasure as he is able to carry. The whole process now comes to an end with two important recitations the discharge of the Spirit, and the prayer of thanksgiving to God. The Discharge I am pleased and contented with thee, Prince Lucifer, for the moment. Leave thou in peace now, and go in quiet and without trouble. Do not forget our pact, or I shall blast thee with my wand. Amen. Thanksgiving Prayer O powerful God, creator of all things for the use of man, thanks to thee for granting our desires. Amen. <laughs>